we can look at the COVID-19 uh, crisis in two ways. A, it's a, a wake-up call for us. Um, it's There's a new sense of urgency uh, out there in industry around the world. I think people uh, maybe have got themselves, had got themselves into a false sense of security because post-GFC we had many years of, uh, several years of growth and growth really makes you lazy and un, unempathetic. Um, and the second thing is that the it's a once in a generation opportunity in my view to reshape our supply chains. There's some fundamental problems with our existing supply chain thinking which haven't been addressed um, in the first 50 years. And it, because it's all been too hard and life's been going along pretty good anyhow in most parts of the world, lots of growth and growth hides all those sins. But of course, uh, now along comes COVID and it, it, it's, it, it sort of hit us at both ends. It started off um, in many ways in China creating a, if you like, a, a supply problem at the back end where suddenly many of us around the world realised that just about everything we bought came out of China and that was probably because a lot of our procurement um, managers had been looking globally uh, at, uh, and sourcing, um, you know, uh, products uh, at lowest price and, and quite good quality as well. Um, but of course, as... Uh, things developed in China in the first wave, uh, we, we discovered then that they got up and going, but just when they are up and going, other countries in Europe, um, in, in Africa, um, the US, uh, Australasia and places like that, um, we started to, um, uh, we were all locked down trying to stop the COVID spread and consequently it became an, a demand problem. So. You know, it, it's it's really hit us at both ends. And in the short term, uh, there's some things we can do. Uh, we've certainly got to address the issue of uh, diversification of our supply base because that's become absolutely essential. And maybe we've got to go back and look at our product range and and and, and prioritise that, prioritise our our uh, supply base, uh, prioritise our customers in the short term. In the longer term, there's some other things we've got to do, and these are the things I mainly want to talk about. Uh, during the course of this uh, short talk. And what I'm going to talk to you about, um, if you like, are a number of things which all add up to two major uh, things that we've got to keep our eye on for the next five to ten years. One, uh, we've really got to improve the visibility in our supply chains. Now, and what I mean by that is uh, that, that's upstream towards our suppliers and downstream towards our customers. Um, the what has caught us out so badly uh, in, in this uh, crisis is that we just haven't had the con connection uh, the or the the digital connection that's allowed us to look at what's happening in our supply chains and to take action quickly so uh, visibility is really the number one issue that we've got to address to prepare ourselves for what will surely be other crises uh, coming forward in the years to come. The second thing uh, that I wanted to address all through my talk to you today is what I call resilience. And you've heard this term, resilience. How do we, how do we prepare ourselves? How do we build redundancy into our system? Uh, what cost will that be? Uh, how much, how much are we prepared to invest in, in that extra resilience to mitigate the risk uh, that we, we know uh, will come when we have discontinuities and extreme disruptions. So all the things I want to talk to you in the next um, maybe 15 or 20 minutes are really uh, more strategic ways of looking at how we can improve our visibility and improve our resilience. We are completely reversing the way we've been designing supply chains of the last 50 years. In the last 50 years, we've been designing our supply chains by sitting inside our businesses, looking at our customer base, taking a view of what we think they uh, are looking for, preparing all the technology and the processes and the teams and the organisation structures on the inside and, and virtually then trying to connect with our customers and finding out progressively that, you know, there is a misalignment there 
measured by the sort of uh, customer satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And so what, what, what we've been sort of pioneering is the other way around and saying, hang on, the way to transform your business and to get it right in terms of the sort of configurations that you develop inside your business is to try to better understand the, 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 the behavioral thinking, you know, the thought processes inside your customers as they look back towards your business. How do they want to buy? What do they want to buy? You know, how do they want to be serviced, etc.? And we call that outside in thinking. So I hope, uh, you know, if you don't remember anything more from my discussion with you this afternoon, you'll appreciate that we are turning this thing on its head. We're, we are going 180 degrees away from inside out thinking, which is this way. And we're going around here and we're looking back towards us and saying, well, if we understand and, it can, and, and can interpret what our customers' uh, demand patterns are, and we can, I'm going to explain to you how we do this to some extent, either by some uh, primary research and by more progressively looking at analytics, then we can come inside the business and we can, using this frame of reference, we can be much more precise in the way we design our supply chains that are actually going to service our customer. And in, in the process of doing that, what we're going to find is the best of both worlds strategy, that, that we're going to get away from this old paradigm where we used to say, well, as our customer satisfaction improves, we're probably having to add cost faster than, than, than anything else. And at some point at very high levels of satisfaction, we're going to have costs to go to infinity. And it's not quite like that at all. What we're saying now is if you can understand uh, your customers more precisely and segment them in a way that, that, that you can service more precisely, what you're going to end up with is, you know, actually getting reduction in cost because we, we've been over-servicing our, our customers for years and we want to stop the over-servicing and move the, the, the resources that we're using in over-servicing customers to those customers who, sorry, I seem to have lost my um, place here, and move these customers, uh, this money across to rewarding those those collaborative customers uh, and and in as a result of that we're going to see customer satisfaction going up we're going to see revenue and more and more now I'm seeing organizations who are catching on to this and finding that managing their supply chains are not just about being cost effective but it's about understanding how the, you know the supply chain can become a very positive uh, impact or can have a very positive impact on revenue so just going back to this slide, really the problem we've got then is this, and it's, this diagram pretty much says it all. I could probably use this as the one slide for the day, but right now in most companies, we've got some sort of functional, um, functional type of organization structure, managing vertically. We've got uh, customers out here where we're not doing a very good job on segmenting. We're segmenting them along all the wrong parameters, you know, we're talking about large customers, small customers, uh, profitable customers, uh, you know, in, in using institutional segments like, you know, their, their retailers or wholesalers. We're, we're using all those terms which actually don't help at all in understanding how to differentiate what the customers are trying to tell us. And at the other end, we're doing exactly the same with our, with our um, uh, suppliers, we're not segmenting them, they're not understanding what their motivations are. So consequently, we, we're in a muddle as we try to move from here to here through the across the different functions. And the problem is this, is that we continue to try to manage our businesses vertically when actually the, the supply chains are flowing horizontally. And as such, we're 90 degrees out of phase with our, with our supply chains and our customers all the way. So going forward, if you, if you, by using this alignment thinking that I talked about here, um, and this is just a bit of a, a sort of high level picture, what we are looking to try to do is to segment the marketplace and, and get a behavioral segmentation in here, which tells us about the different groupings based on their buying behavior and, what, and how they expect 
to be, and, and the good news is there's four or five of these that will give us about an 80% fit to the marketplace. And the same thing applies in our, uh, in our supply base, that we can do, look at our uh, supply base and we can work out which of those suppliers are, are collaborative, which, which are, uh, you know, can give us the low unit cost, which can give us the project type management we're looking for, which can give us the quick capacity we need, which can give us the entrepreneur. So, and, and we can start to think in terms of seconding people from out, across these functions, because we still need to keep the functions for the specialisms, but set up teams uh, on the side multidisciplinary teams which are going to be starting to manage the horizontal flow so you know if you look at companies like zara today that's exactly what they're doing they've got multidisciplinary teams made up of storm operations executives logistics executives manufacturing executives design executives which make all the decisions in their supply chain and 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 actually manage the horizontal flow and that's why their lead times are so short so you know, what I, I guess my first major point to you then is that organization design, as big and all as it is, has got to be grappled with because until we fix that problem, we're only going to be working around the edges. Now, the second part, as I sort of intimated, is the out, of the outside in, is that we've got to do that segmentation. And what I wanted to just show you here is that from our research, and we've done work in just about every field you can think of in products and services. We've even been into financial services, insurance, banking. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're an industrial company like Cobus is Imperial. Um, you know, wherever you've got people buying at the consumer level or at the business level, um, then you've got to understand their behavior. And the fascinating thing to me is that if you look around the world at the various universities, they've all been treating this, they've all been in denial, if you like, about the the impact of buying behavior on the design and operation of supply chains. But if you want to get ahead of the game, you can actually go out and segment and do a behavioral segmentation. And what you'll find, and this is what we've found in across the world, uh, is that there's there'll be four or five um, different segments that will give you about an 80% fit to the market. The these four across here, the collaborative, transactional, um, the uh, campaign and dynamic are what I call the, the, the business as usual ones. And when I talk about business as usual, I'm going to make this point strongly a little later that post the COVID-19, what we've got to do is manage the world like a parallel universe going forward. We've got to have a portfolio of supply chains that will allow us to manage in a reasonably volatile world up to plus or minus 50 percent demand variation and then we've got to start putting in place the the, the fifth supply chain over here which is what i'm calling the inner the fully flexible supply chain where we have got to start thinking seriously about preparing for the next big major extreme disruption and in the last 10 years, I've mainly been saying, well, we should be sort of setting this up as a part-time activity. After COVID-19 and the impact it's had on things, I think we've got to be a lot more creative about this and start to set up a small full-time group of people who are looking uh, at this whole potential of disruption. Um, and it's probably going to be things like cyber disruption uh, as well coming forward apart from you know the sort of diseases that we've seen so think about that the, the four on the left the, the the blue the dark blue the red and and the, and the bright red they're the, the four what i call uh, business as usual um where you've got the collaborative and transactional buying behaviors which lead you to you know a collaborative supply chain and lean supply chain which are pretty steady and pretty much give you a base load um, and then we've got the, the campaign supply chain where you've got major projects or it could even be a pharmaceutical company where you're having major sellouts or you've got a new product you're launching. And then you've got the agile supply chain where you're having to deal with customers who are uh, you know, coming at you from out of nowhere and, and being very demanding. And of course, the extreme variation of that is the fully flexible supply chain, which is really what we're doing, trying to cope with. And we're going to need some systems and we're going to need some very clever people working together to handle that.
Thank you.